atmospheric nitrogen. And we all know how they fix is that they have a symbiotic relationship with the bacterium in the soil, uh, rhizobium. And when they work together, you see nodules on the root. They are fixing nitrogen. Uh, they are adding nitrogen to the soil. Now, uh, this is how the nodules look like. Uh, uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the amount of nitrogen these legumes generate or uh, put it back, about 40 to 60 percent of nitrogen content of legume is available in one year, which is pretty good. Uh, they can uh, supply a lot of nitrogen back, uh, what they have fixed from the atmosphere. And another point to uh, keep in mind is not all nitrogen legume is fixed. Uh, it has to take some nitrogen from the soil also to grow. So it uses some nitrogen from the soil to grow and then it fixes uh, the rest from the atmosphere. Uh, <clears throat> now this bacterium in the soil, they are very specific with which legume they will work. No, not all bacterium will work with all legumes. So if you look at this table, uh, if you want to look at the plant, pea, vetches or the clover or the beans, uh, for uh, a bacterium called Rhizobium leguminoserum, that is the one which actually works uh, to fix nitrogen. So if you have a crop, let's, a crop, let's say uh, you have a soybean and you, have, and you do not have Rhizobium fredi in the soil, it's not going to work. Because these bacterium, they are very specific, they, they will work only with their host plant. So just to give an idea that you know, not all bacteria would work with all plants, they are specific to plants. So for example, soybean and tropical legume like Arachis or Leucina, you need Brady rhizobium japonicum in the soil. So that's why we suggest or recommend to inoculate uh, the seed with those bacteria and mix it and then put it in the soil because that will ensure that there will be nitrogen fixation happening. Crimson clover, uh, we also got a chance to go out and uh, take a look at the plots. It, my, in my experience, it doesn't overwinter. Uh, it, 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 it winter kills, but it's an excellent crop. Uh, it's a great crop and what J Jason was showing today in the morning to grow some uh, cover crops between the plastic, uh, this could be a good contender. Uh, we could grow crimson clover uh, between the plastic. In, if you look at the biomass, three to five ton per acre, uh, planting is again late fall or six weeks before the killing frost if you want to do it in the fall. You can plant it in the spring also. I did plant it in the spring. It did pretty okay. Then we just tilled it in because we were trying to just look at the crop, how it is performing. And it can be companion planted with rye. The seeding grade is a little high as compared to other clovers, about 20 to 30 pound per acre. But uh, again, it can attract a lot of pollinators. We had uh, discussion about Bersim clover, that's also a cover crop uh, which can be integrated, uh, doesn't overwinter, uh, it winter kills. Uh, seeding rate about 15 to 20 pounds per acre, that's uh, very normal. You can plant it early in the spring or late in the fall. Now uh, with Bersim clover, uh, I had a plot at the hot research station where we wanted to control uh, uh, grass weeds around that plot. So we used a herbicide called POST for, con for controlling grass and actually POST uh, affected Bersim clover. So Bersim clover has some kind of a, uh, an issue when you use POST as a herbicide. So if you're controlling grass, if you're using POST and if Bersim clover is close by, that crop can be affected. And this is based on our observation last summer. Then uh, in legum legumes, we have the red clover and the white clover. Jason talked about white clover. White clover is perennial. Uh, and uh, another difference is white clover is expensive than red clover. Red clover you would get for about a dollar for a pound of seed. White clover can go to a, about $2.50 for a pound of uh, seed. So they're expensive, but they are perennial. Red clover is not perennial. It's more kind of a biennial crop. If you look at the... Uh, Biomass, three to five tons in uh, white clover, three to four, almost same there in that range. Both can be planted. Uh, this can be planted late fall or even early spring. Uh, red clover is usually planted earlier in the spring, but these are good options for vegetable growers if they want to add nitrogen uh, to their cropping systems. I thought I'll uh, pull in some numbers based on different literature reviews and different publications have given different uh, rates uh, at which the amount of nitrogen these cover crops add. Uh, so this is a generalization. Red clover, about 50 to 120, you'll see it's a big range. 
uh, hairy wedge, about 50 to 100 pounds, and that's pretty uh, uh, standard. And I have seen that in a couple of my studies. Austrian winter peas, 30 to 70, and cow pea uh, also, it's about 40 to uh, 100. Now, cow pea is again a summer growing crop. Uh, it can uh, grow uh, very quickly, smother the weeds, the whole plot, you know, it might go up to my waist height. It, it's, uh, it can g get that big, uh, but it's a great cover crop to integrate for that summer period. It loves the heat to grow, just like buckwheat and the sorghum sudan grass. Uh, hairy vetch is, you know, everybody loves it uh, for nitrogen, uh, one to two ton per acre of biomass. It can, it grows very well when it's planted with rye and most of the vegetable growers would mix rye and hairy vetch together. Seeding rate is about 20 to 25 pounds per acre. The, the cost of hairy vetch is slowly going up. Uh, more and more growers want to use it, so it's a supply and demand issue. Here is the picture of a hairy vetch. This, this was at the Muscatine Island Research Station uh, last summer. We did some experiments with strip tillage in the melons and uh, hairy wedge and hairy wedge and cow and uh, uh, rye were some of our treatments. So this is how the plot looked like in uh, end of May. Question. Yeah, yes, ma'am. The people that uh, the rye in the uh, wedge since that's or with any legume, is it going to capitalize on the fixed end then? It capitalize on the? On the fixed end, the nitrogen that the legumes? Yeah, yeah. so there has been studies which have looked at the nitrogen uh, when wedge is grown alone and wedge is grown in a mixture of rye and nitrogen. And most of the studies show that it's better when it's grown in a mixture because legumes uh, generally try to fix more um, try to fix nitrogen more efficiently when the nitrogen levels are low so if you go in a soil where you have a, already have a high nitrogen level they won't fix as much nitrogen as compared to when they grow in a field which is kind of marginal in terms of nitrogen so when you grow it with rye rye takes up a lot of nitrogen and so uh, which is doesn't have access to a big pool and it does actually better in fixing the nitrogen you ever have the rye kind of choking out the hairy bed? Uh, usually what would happen is wedge would just uh, grab onto the rye and just grow on top of the rye. Mm -hmm. And they, they are great companions. Uh, I have not seen any issue with them competing with each other. So uh, just I wanted to show you cow pee. This is cow pee here. This is at the uh, hot research station we did an experiment last uh, summer, you could see the thick growth of cover crop. This is almost 50 days old from seeding. So if you want to have a nice huge uh, you know, big foliage cover crop, no weeds at all. There's no way any weed can grow in there. Quick turnover, it can fix nitrogen, so there are a lot of advantages there. How did you kill that then? Uh, we just mowed and we tilled it in. Okay. The, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is pretty low, so it gets uh, disintegrated pretty quickly. I'll move on to uh, brassica cover crops and some of the main ones which I have used are yellow mustard, brown mustard and oil seed radish. There was a question today about the thickness of the root of radish. They can grow almost two feet into the soil if they have a long growing season and I'll show you a picture of that. But they break compaction, they are great as biofumigants, they sterilize the soil for vegetable growers in Florida, California, they were using methyl bromide before, but you, are, you cannot use that anymore. It's under critical use exemption. So folks are moving on to using brassica cover crop, which produce compounds which actually kill uh, microorganisms in the soil. This is just I mentioned about methyl bromide. It's under critical use exemption. And so uh, brassica cover crops are also known as biofumigants. They fumigate the soil. Uh, this is how you would uh, uh, incorporate the brassica cover crop and the reason I put this, you, uh, we usually flail mow it before we incorporate it in because to get the desired effect of bio fumigation, you need to chop the crop and then incorporate. Now you'll ask me a question, why do we have to chop it? Why don't we just come and till it in? Uh, the reason is uh, uh, in brassica cover crop, uh, if you look at a cell inside that crop, any leaf or stem or root, uh, the, it has two compounds in that unbroken cell. It has a compound called myrosinase and a compound called glucosinolate. 
Now, if you don't chop the crop, this won't happen, the breaking of the cell. When the cell breaks, these two compounds unite and in, pre in presence of water, you have, a you have a product called isothiocyanate and that is what gives the biofumigation property to that cover crop. So if you don't mix it, chop it and then incorporate, you won't get the effect of isothiocyanate. So that's why we always recommend that we need to chop it and then incorporate. This is uh, 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 data from a study which we did on uh, celery. Uh, we can just focus on this one which is after trimming, after trimming the celery. We compared different cover crops, cereal rye, oil seed radish, oriental mustard, yellow mustard and a control plot, nothing. And this study is, uh, has, was going on that plot for about four, or four years. So that's why you see a startling effect. Otherwise to get the benefits of cover crop, they have to be grown number of years to get the effect uh, on soil properties and sometimes on the yield as well. But you can clearly see that these three cover crops did better than the yellow, which is the cereal rye, and uh, also the control, which had no cover crops. So brassicas really worked well in, in celery production system. And these were muck soils we worked on, so high organic matter, a lot of carbon. And so brassica could behave a little bit different in other mineral soil, but usually the trend is, this, is the same. Now my wife doesn't like when I work in muck soils because she feels that I lose three inches every year, which is correct because muck soils erode pretty fast and next year when you go there, you'll be three inch down. So, uh, so uh, that was, uh, now I'll probably sh uh, shift gears quickly. I do not have much time, but I would like to focus on the soil biology also because that's again an integral part which the cover crops affect. We know we need the bacteria, the fungi, the nematode, and, and I'll talk more about nematodes and the mycorrhizae to make an active soil uh, uh, biology environment so that the crop roots can grow well, they can supply nutrients to the plants and plants grow well as well. Uh, I just uh, mentioned these facts, breakdown of complex molecules, pathogen suppression, stabilization of soil aggregates. This is all microbes do in the soil and to stimulate that microorganisms, you need cover crops. Uh, they also help to uh, cycle nutrients and I might go a little bit detail in that. But before that, I just wanted to show you four plates here. And uh, which one do you think has more colors in it, more holes with colors? Obviously not this one, but maybe this one and maybe this one. Also a little bit of this one. This is just an example. I didn't bring these plates with me, but uh, this is a, an, an analysis which we do in the lab called the community level physiological profiling. I'm using these big terms, but it's fairly simple. What we have is we have different carbon substrates in those plates. We bring the soil from different cover crop plots, extract those soils, inoculate these plates. And if there were microbes in the soil to start with, they will start eating the food which is in these trays and the tray and the cell will change color. So if you see more color, which means there were more microorganisms of different types because these all substrates are different. And you can tell that there is more biodiversity in that soil. So a control plot where there was only rye, no compost, there was no compost added but rye, there are definitely some microbes in the soil, uh, but not as diverse as when you use rye wedge and compost. You can see most of the cells are colored here. So this is a very simple indicator of telling how uh, uh, biologically active and how diverse the microorganisms are there in your soil. Of course, compost helps. This had no compost. This also had no compost, but the rye and the wedge combination helped. There was still some biology going on. But when we talk about nematodes, we always think they are bad, right? We have the pin nematode, we have the stunt uh, nematode, we have root lesion nematode. So everybody thinks nematodes are bad. But if you think of nematodes, there is another class of nematodes which we really want in the soil. We want those nematodes in there. And this is why we want them. So let's say you have tomato crop growing. What nematodes do is nutrient cycling and I'm going to show you how they do it. So you have a lot of happy bacteria. You want the bacteria in the soil, biologically active. <coughs> Two of them, usually a bacteria will have a CN ratio of 5 is to 1. So you have two bacteria, they're happy. And then comes a nematode. And you know there are different types of nematodes. This particular nematode eats only bacteria. It's bacteria versus nematode. So this nematode, in order to satisfy its carbon to nitrogen ratio of 10 is to 1, it has to eat two bacteria, right, to get the carbon correct. 
because it has it needs 10 so it has get 5 from here and 5 from here but the carb but the nitrogen it needs only one to maintain its physiological processes in this in the body so what happens to the other nitrogen that gets excreted and that nitrogen is made available to the plant so we have bacteria to start with and we have bacteria versus nematodes in the soil which will release the nitrogen in these bacteria and provide it back to the plant so we do need some uh, uh, bacteria versus nematodes in the soil and cover crops help in improving the amount of bacteria versus nematodes in the soil and that is what this will show you so this is the same study from the celery which I showed you earlier I want you to focus on two of these numbers these are the plant parasitic nematodes sting, sting uh, stunt nematodes, pin nematodes, uh, root lesion nematodes, we just counted and we saw that the control plot, no cover crop, we had about 178 of them, plant parasitic. When we had cover crops, it reduced the plant parasitic nematodes and it was the least in the oil seed radish treatment. So you can see some biofumigation happening there. So good, this is nice, but even nice is the bacterial feeders. So in bacterial feeding, uh, feeder nematodes, if you look at control plot, 383, you have the oil seed radish plot, 1382. And you just saw what the bacterial feeding nematodes do, right? So it's good to have brassica cover crops in those systems because it is affecting the soil biology. It is improving, increasing the number of bacterial feeder nematodes. At the same time, it's decreasing the number of plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, you can get a lot of this information from the, the guide which you have, the field guide. It has all the seeding rates, uh, when to incorporate and all that. So I will not touch base on that. Now the other part of, our, of cover crop work is I can do all this at the research station, but we need adoption. We need growers to take this and run away with it. So uh, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, field uh, demo plots and work with growers. This is uh, Greg Reinhardt. He's a vegetable grower in Ogden. Some of you might be knowing him. And so we did an experiment at Greg's plot. He grew some uh, yellow mustard, some oil seed radish, and we compared that with the control plot out there. So uh, we are still analyzing the data which we collected from his plot. You know, usually grower plot, you do not get a lot of data back, but uh, Greg is now happy. He knows about cover crop and he's planning to grow, integrate that in his crop production system. Uh, different types of, uh, uh, Oil seed, uh, brassica crops, this is the oil seed radish. You can look at the root system here. It can certainly break compaction in your soil. Oriental mustard, not big of a root system. Yellow mustard, more of a shoot biomass than the root. A brown mustard, there is some, but uh, oil seed radish definitely better if your objective is to break compaction and increase aeration in your soil. Oil seed radish, we established it uh, on a 25 acre commercial farm. This is at Michigan. Uh, the grower is big on oilseed radish. Now it's very difficult to take him away from oilseed radish. He always puts oilseed radish. And we say keep rotating, grow some other cover crops too, to have some diversity. But uh, a picture from the same plot, this is a cultivar daikon, oilseed radish. But the cover crop grew for a long time. It had enough time to grow. We seeded, uh, I think somewhere in end of July, so it had a three, month period close to to grow so you could see the amount of root biomass it has put same with another cultivar called defender and this was one of the odd plant out there but you could see what the root system is of that of that oil seed radish crop this experiment is we did at the hot station last year and, I, and I'm trying what I'm trying to do is what Jason is doing here trying to improvise and get more cover crops integrated in the vegetable production systems we have cucumber, cucumbers growing here and I have yellow mustard in the alleyways the objective is to attract pollinators to get more pollinate even pollination good quality crop but there are issues too because this yellow mustard and uh, had a lot of bees coming in there. I took some videos of bee activity, but it also attracted cucumber beetles. So we had damage in cucumber uh, uh, fruit because of the beetle, but they, they were less misshapen fruits because the pollination was happening better way when you have uh, yellow mustard between those uh, rows. So uh, this could be a, you know, we, can, we have to expand and we also looked at a study in which we put all across yellow mustard, it didn't make much of a difference. Both gave the, uh, almost the same yield. Now, uh, uh, crop diversity, the cover crop which you're growing and the biology can influence uh, 
uh, the microbes in the soil. So you have different cover crops, maybe rye, maybe yellow mustard, maybe clover, and they produce different compounds. And these compounds, uh, these roots have different, different depth, their different properties in their shoot. And when you incorporate that in the soil, all those, micro, all those compounds go and then they affect the soil biology. And one of the example is here. This is a side by side comparison of lettuce. Uh, lettuce grown in a control plot. Uh, this is last fall, no cover crop. You can look at the growth of the lettuce. This is lettuce which was uh, transplanted in sorghum sudan grass. A sorghum sudan grass was incorporated. I waited for 10 days and then I planted my lettuce. But these lettuce didn't grow out of this uh, stage. You know, they always were affected. So you see some allelopathy going on with cover crops. So we should be careful of when we are terminating and when we are putting our uh, vegetable crop in there. So uh, something we learned and we are going to work on it a little bit more better and see what's the planting back period. Is it 10 day? Is it 14 day? Is it 18 day? And a graduate student is going to work on this project. Okay, I don't have much time, but uh, I'll quickly go through just to show when you can incorporate cover, cover crops in a vegetable system. If this is your cash crop, you can put it in the spring, you can put it in the fall, keep going. If you're putting the spring, you have options of mustard, barley, clover, cash crop could be sweet corn, snap beans or broccoli. You can do, uh, if you have cash crop in the uh, both ends, you can do one in the middle. That's the uh, buckwheat and uh, sorghum sudan grass or yellow mustard. What are the options here? Sorghum sudan grass, soybean, buckwheat, you have, uh, and then we have winter kill of those. This is a typical one, the winter off season when you put a rye and a wedge at the end of the growing season, they keep growing and you terminate them here. You can interseed too. So I wanted to show this picture where we had broccoli, but that's interseeded with rye. Uh, so there are opportunities available to interseed and uh, a quick picture, this is from Muscatine, we did an experiment with pumpkins, no till, uh, strip till pumpkins, not no till, but this is a control plot, so we, uh, no cover crops, only pumpkin and you could see the weeds and then I will show you the cover crop treatment, we had rye there and you could see the amount of wheat suppression with that rye in that system. So in the strip till system in, in pumpkins. Another grower uh, in, in Boone, uh, in, in Bondurant, uh, Daryl Geisler, this is his field. He does strip tillage. You can see the residue, the rye residue. And these are the pumpkins here, if you look at the green points. Uh, I, I had a small research project at his farm. Uh, this is how it looked like in the beginning of summer. This is how it looked like in the fall. And he did not apply any herbicide. There were no weeds at all. So you could see a difference. This cover crop did a great, but he uses almost 400 pounds per acre of rye. So a very high seeding rate of rye. With that, uh, it's, there are a lot of people who help uh, to conduct research at different research stations and, and grower plots, grad students. Uh, farm superintendents who help and, and the greenhouse manager. Uh, this is my email, so you can always email me back and Jimmy, I think there's information on my, e uh, reg on, on my email, so just email me if you have any question. I also have a blog where I update about vegetable production, what's happening, any insect, any pest or soil or any, any interesting thing which is going on in the field of vegetable production.